I have mentioned in one of the previous weeks that I consider these teachings uh, from the Buddha on mindful awareness to really be uh, just a beautiful articulation of what we could probably refer to as human common sense. You know, I don't think we'd get any argument if we, you know, if someone made the case for the opposite of mindful awareness, like, you know, I think what's best in life is to be distracted and to be in denial and to be, have a superficial attention to things based on misperception. You know, nobody would think that was a good strategy for living, to be operating with misperception and superficial, distracted attention. And one of the things that hopefully you're recognizing, um, having just been reflecting, and you know, I'll, I'll mention this in the guided sit tonight, but it's really appropriate for our meditation instruction to be as simple as not me trying to be mindfully aware, but in a sense, just, <coughs> excuse me, just noticing, <coughs> excuse me, just noticing the awareness. What is mindful awareness? Just to be interested, like, is there mindful awareness now? And you know, you might see the mind scrambling a little when you ask a question like that, a little self-consciousness or whatever it might be. But even that can be something being known. And isn't it interesting that it feels, it can at least feel a little awkward or almost at times inappropriate, like, I'm not sure I should be present, you know, or I'm not sure I should be seeing things, feeling things, this directly, this immediately. In a funny way, we've gotten used to our frenzy, you know, flitting about on the surface of things, not really landing in a way and recognizing this very fundamental truth of what it is to be a human being, which is there is awareness knowing whatever it's knowing in the moment. And that's so central to us understanding what it is to be a human being, to understand this very simple ongoing operation of awareness knowing an object. So it's a marriage where there's the knowing, knowing something, some experience, some sound, some sight, some sensation, some thought. So the knowing mind, the awareness could be knowing something external, like a sound or a sight or something internal, like a thought or an emotion, even something relatively subtle like the attitude of mind now is the mind grumpy is the mind kind is the mind aversive fearful and so mindful awareness this particular kind of mental muscle spiritual muscle we're developing it's really recognizing this essential truth to being alive something is being known something is being known and now we're adding this piece we call mindfulness or mindful awareness where there's that simple honest recognition oh this is being known this is being known so we're creating this space this reflective space where the <clears throat> wisdom in the mind recognizes that this experience is being known that's why we can you know when we've been distracted and we want to start over we can just ask the question well, what's the mind knowing now what's being known 
What's the mind doing? What's the mind knowing? Just a simple question like that can get us back on track with the practice. Oh, this experience is being known. So that we don't feel that we have to rush back to the meditation anchor in order to be mindful. Just knowing that the mind's been distracted, as you probably have begun, begun to understand, is a moment of mindfulness. Knowing that my mind is discombobulated, know, knowing that I'm irritable, is a moment of mindfulness. Because mindfulness doesn't care what object is being known. Mindfulness is all about knowing that this object is being known. Right? We're remember, remembering to know that this is what's being known now. So it's like that reflective space of awareness. Oh yeah. Being here now is like this. This experience of being here now is like this. That's mindfulness. And in that space, you know, in that reflective knowing space, how it's like this, there's both the object that the knowing mind is knowing, but in a sense, different. It's a, just another object, but the mind that's knowing whatever it is that's predominant might be like if you're with your meditation object, like the breath, the knowing mind is knowing the breath, but the knowing mind might be colored with an attitude or a mood. Like the knowing mind might be a little impatient or judgmental or aggressive, controlling or bored or kind or curious or tranquil, right? So in a way we can say there are two things that can be known, the object that's being known and the attitude through which the knowing mind is knowing the particular object of the present moment. And so the last few weeks especially, I've been just <clears throat> in the instructions, just giving the cue to notice the attitude of mind, because it's really important. And in, in the Buddhist tradition, you know, we talk about the three unwholesome roots and the three wholesome roots. And there's any number of ways, you know, we could talk about unskillful and skillful qualities of mind. This is one of the simpler from the Buddhist tradition. And so the three unwholesome roots, you might guess, you know, the quality of greediness, stinginess, the quality of fear and aversion and anger, right? So you could just call that aversion includes everything from you know total hatred to just even being bored is a kind of aversion and then delusion and then the wholesome would be the opposite so instead of greed a kind of contentedness generosity the ability to let go or to renounce something instead of anger kindness goodwill instead of delusion connecting with clarity with the way it is there's no diluted de delusion there. Like when I touch the bell, you know, and I feel the weight and the hardness and the smoothness of the bell, when I'm not in the concept of what I think this is, but I'm in the direct tactile experience, there's really no doubt. Oh yeah, it's hard, smooth, it's heavy, right? There's no kind of confusion in my mind. The confusion comes when I'm in the concept, like, is it an expensive bell? Where would somebody buy a bell like this? Do you guys have a better bell than I have? Right? And then I'm in that conceptual world and there's plenty of room for doubt and confusion. But not in a simple moment. Like you might have a lot of doubt about whether you're a good meditator, but then in the next moment, you can connect with the touching of the breath as it comes in the nostrils. And you're just feeling that relative cool sensation as the breath comes in through the nostrils. In those moments <clears throat> when there's that simple knowing of that touch, there's no doubt in the mind. So 
one attitude, and I mentioned this last week, that in week five, we often talk about loving kindness practice um, because <clears throat> I'm presuming it's true for all of us in the group tonight, you know, the 39 of us or whatever, that we have actually bumped into a really beautiful, generous quality in our mind, in our heart, where the kindness was uncontrived. You weren't trying to be a kind person. There was just that natural openness of goodwill, of kindness or love or whatever you want to call it. So anybody doubt that your heart, your mind has that capacity to be kind in that uncontrived, actual way? Speak now. <laughs> so I'm assuming that we've all had at least one moment in our life where we've noticed our heart is capable of being good. So this, that memory like of a time, you know, could be simple. Like for me, you know, I have a pretty good relationship with my, our cat. It's actually my, mostly my spouse cat. But she uh, lets me be sort of a grandparent where I don't have that many responsibilities, but I get to love up the cat. And uh, so sometimes, you know, I'll hold the cat against my chest and we'll look out a big window often with it wide open like a big screen patio door so the cat can look outside and we have our moment and the quality of kindness or love or whatever you want to call it that open-hearted unconditional i don't want to harm you in any way feeling totally trustworthy goodness of my heart you know i can remember that and the interesting thing about that attitude of kindness is it's, it's a little contagious. So even though I use that memory of standing there with my cat, you know, whatever the memory would be for you, it could be getting a hug from a friend or seeing the neighbor kid that you delight in because they're so sweet, the three-year-old who lives near you or something like that, or a niece, a nephew. So it doesn't matter what the particular mental image might be because the point of bringing that to mind is to just be reminded that this heart has this capacity to be kind and then to notice, I mean, it sort of naturally begs the question, well, what about now? Like even just having me talk about this the last few minutes and now we can look at the folks including the people who have their video off. We just have the name or something sitting there, but we realize, you know what? There are other human beings out there and we're all here together in the cyberspace. And you know what? These folks probably suffer like I do and hopefully have moments of ease and happiness like I do sometimes. And you know what? I, I this heart is capable quite naturally, unforced, having the wish, may you be happy. May you be happy in your lives. May your hearts be at ease. And even though I don't know many of you well, it's easy for me to wish well for you. You know, may your life go well. May it be easy. May you navigate the difficult stuff with real grace and wisdom and skill and forgiveness. May you be happy. And now immediately, I don't know if those wishes help you, but immediately my attitude has shifted to whatever kind of irritation I might have picked up during the day from difficult interactions or just even habits of being irritable or grumpy or trolling or whatever it might be defective they get pushed out you know the buddha uses the image you know back in the buddha's day they didn't have nails so much they used wooden pegs to build structures right and then one of the wooden pegs might get rotten so you take a new hardwood peg you'd pound it in and you'd push the old peg right out and replace it with a solid brand new peg and this is just one image the Buddha used about how whatever mood, whatever attitude is present, it's not set in stone. We often have the idea when I'm depressed, when I'm angry, 
when I'm full of lust, when I'm this or I'm that, when we have a particular attitude of mind, we often imagine that's who I am. I can't be anybody else right now. And there's a little truth to that, but it's only for that moment that it's true. Like right now, the mind is the way it is. But the mind is quite uh, unfixed in its essence. And if we were really honest with ourselves, we could probably bring to mind, it's a little disconcerting when we see this, but when we're in a particular mood, have a particular attitude, and then something happens, and it's like it flips on a dime, where now we're, we have a different attitude, a different mood. Right? Isn't that true? So it's much more fluid than we might think. And the reason I'm spending the time now talking about this is it's really worth at the beginning of a sit, you know, so you have 30 minutes, let's say, to take some time first to acknowledge the present mood, the attitude, the qualities in the mind that are actually already there, maybe have some momentum. And then over time, getting quite skilled at shifting the space so that we have a really useful attitude for the meditation, like metta is the Pali word for loving kindness or basic goodness, friendliness of heart. And then when that basic goodness runs into suffering, we call it karuna, which is usually translated as compassion. When that beautiful quality of love runs into something beautiful, it's appreciative joy. The Pali word is mudita. And even when things are weird or confusing, ambiguous, we can, love still knows how to show up, but we might call it, you know, equanimity, like remaining in balance, even though I don't know what the heck's going on, what's up, what's down, what's good, what's bad. But I can be balanced, I can be equanimous, and that's my way of being intimate and really connecting, which is ultimately, that's what love is, that goodness of the heart. It's that capacity, natural capacity of the heart to include everything, not because we like it, but because it's showing up in our experience. And so love, in a sense, says yes, not because I want this moment, these conditions to be the way they are, but the heart says yes, love says yes, because saying no doesn't help, is tight. Only when we look with wisdom, only kind of some, one of these four expressions of love, only that makes sense. So in this way, the Buddha might say, you only need four emotions. This basic goodness or friendliness, what in the tradition is called metta, compassion, when that goodness runs into suffering, my own suffering or you, your suffering, compassion, when it runs into something good or beautiful, that beautiful, joyful appreciation, gladness, and equanimity for everything else. Equanimity, in a way, is, is the foundation, background of love. Because love doesn't really have an agenda except to include or to be close. So um, at the beginning of the sit tonight, I'll give a few instructions about bringing that attitude of love, kindness, basic goodness to mind and keeping it in mind. And so anytime during the 30 minute sit, see if you can refresh that attitude of basic goodness, basic friendliness. And there's room for some creativity here. You have to try, you know, and you could bring an image to mind or if one classic way to bring in some kindness, like if my mind is in a funk or really hurting or is to start caring about how difficult it is right now to be a human being. And immediately, see, like I said earlier, you can go from like really hating what's going on in my life to, oh, honey, it isn't easy being a human being. I care about how difficult it is for me right now. I care enough to stay close. 
and I care enough to wish well for myself, right? And it's just, there's a natural expansive quality, boundless quality to love, because then it's relatively easy to realize, you know, there are other people out of the 39 of us, a big number of folks that are having a hard time in this particular moment. May you also be well. May your heart and body also be at ease. May you be free from suffering, from stress. May your heart be at ease. So you can articulate <clears throat> that flavor of kindness with some words that makes it a little, can make it a little bit more concrete. So easier to <clears throat> have that attitude be the object of a mindful awareness because you're structuring it by repeating or bringing to mind a couple phrases like I just did. But you don't need to bring to mind the phrases because you can just be aware of the quality, the emotion of love. So when the emotion is strong enough, then let that be, you're basically aware of the attitude itself as a, for a moment or two, <clears throat> that's your mindfulness object. <clears throat> but if you're, you know, you notice you've been irritable for a while and you really want to shift the attitude, it feels like a skillful thing to do, then experiment with using phrases and use the words, the phrase that really work for you. A little later before we end at nine, I'll give you a more formal loving kindness meditation instruction. And uh, hopefully some of you looked at week five's, um, the handout for week five, and that's uh, a nice set of specific instructions for each of the four kinds of love, that basic friendliness, metta, compassion, appreciative joy, and equanimity. And it's just a slight, different orientation and it's really good to realize this heart is nimble in that way you know you might have a quality of love that's easier for you like compassion or whatever it might be but you really want your heart to be able to respond in all ways so that any situation that life might deliver you can relate with one of these four emotions and this is even good you know, as you're hearing me talk about it, just to imagine what happened today or what might happen tomorrow. And just imagine only like showing up with one of these four emotions and being really functional and not weird and really being able to, you know, take care of the business of your life with only those four emotions to choose from. Kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, you know, just appreciating what's good in the moment, and equanimity, that profound balance that is even balanced when things are really strange, weird, or ambiguous, or confusing. Any questions about what I've said thus far before we settle into some sitting time? Yes, I have a question. loving kindness is sometimes people translators will chant translate the word metta with the word loving kindness okay uh, yeah gladness gladness okay um sympathetic joy some people translate it too okay Take some questions anything else before we stretch our legs and Get ready for a 30 minute set. Good, so go ahead and if you need to move, do what you can to feel like your body's being taken care of. It won't be perfect as I'm sure you realize, but even this can be an act of kindness, how you settle in to a posture that's relatively still. Yeah, Kabir, did you have something else? Yeah, so. Sure, for a short period of time. There's, it, it can be kind of earthy and grounding to be sitting on the floor, whether you're kneeling or the more traditional cross leg position. But you do definitely want, if you're stiff in the hips, you want to elevate. So you want to sit on a stiff pillow or 
another thing that works well if you don't have a you know an actual meditation cushion which tends to be kind of stiff you can roll a a blanket or um even some like big bath towels several of them roll them and then sit on that or even sitting on a yoga mat that's rolled up can mm-hmm. give you enough height and then you can use other pillows under your knees so that they're not just dangling up high in the air but see if you can prop some things underneath your knees if they're not getting to the ground okay yeah okay cool. yeah. thank you settling in you may just want to take a couple of longer deep breaths take three to five long slow easy breaths filling emptying the lungs and often it's best if you can to breathe through the nostrils not the mouth as if you have all the time in the world to inhale and exhale And how about one more at your own pace? And as we just allow the breathing to continue on its own, knowing that we can trust the body to do the breathing, it's it's always a nice discovery to realize that I don't need to consciously manage the breathing process. There's so much intelligence built into the body. And as we simply sit and feel the sensations of the body sitting, It's a good time to check on the attitude. Is it possible now to be relating to the sitting body, the sensations here, in a kind, generous, compassionate way? And even appreciating with joy the intelligence and health of the body. And whether you'd want to say it with words or not but just that feeling may this body be at ease may it be happy and at ease this body i care about this body care enough right now to be close and care enough to simply feel any sensations that are here to feel So each of us in our own way, in an uncontrived way, just having a little love fest with the body, just appreciating it. And if it's hurting a lot, having some compassion, some tenderness. Yeah, sometimes the body hurts like this, and I care about that. I'm not afraid of whatever the body, bodily sensations are now. And feeling confident that it's possible now to be relating to the sitting body, the breathing body with kindness, with a kind of love, trustworthy love. As if the whole space of the body is somehow in a simple way touched by this kind presence this generous presence. Nothing needs to be left out. And with this attitude of kindness, just aware of the meditation anchor for those of you who are using mindfulness of breathing, just notice that the body's already breathing in its own way. And it's totally fine, however the body is breathing already. 
And we're just aware of that rhythm of breathing in, breathing out. And in a kind way, as we're breathing in, feeling the totality of the whole body, breathing out, experiencing the whole body just as it is. as an expression of kindness, just sustaining that simple and kind presence from the beginning of the in-breath through to the end, from the beginning of the out-breath through to the end, but in a gentle, non-controlling way, forgiving way, in a way that this kind Presence is really having a calming effect on the body. Breathing in, experiencing the whole body. Breathing out, experiencing the whole body. And remind the body and the mind that it's okay. It's really good to relax and soften. We don't need to be tight in any way to do the meditation. And even though we're aware of breathing in and breathing out one half breath at a time, you can allow the sensations of breathing in and breathing out to go into the background and feeling more generally the whole body as you breathe in and the totality of the whole body as you breathe out. So really noticing this inclusive and generous quality of present moment awareness, breathing in, experiencing the whole body, breathing out, experiencing the whole body just as it is. And any thoughts, distractions, if they're relatively minor, just let them be in the background. No need to be upset or frustrated with thoughts coming and going. But stronger distractions that take the attention, then just practice noticing that the distraction is something being felt, being known. 
So it becomes the meditation object in a sense. Oh, this is being known. It feels like this. Just keep acknowledging that phenomena you're calling a distraction. It's something being known. It feels like this. And see if you can, with kindness, let it cease on its, on its own. So you're not trying to get rid of the distraction. But wisdom and kindness understands that it will pass away in due time. So we're not getting identified with it. We're just noticing it as the next thing showing up in the present moment. I'm going to continue now in silence.
And remember to check the attitude from time to time without judgment. And notice whatever the attitude might be, hope to change. It's not fixed.
keep it really simple. We're learning to bring this kind, generous, present moment awareness using the breath and the whole body as an anchor. But really okay when distractions, other phenomena arise strongly in our experience, then just recognize, okay, this is being known. It's like this now. And we'll take the last few minutes now, sitting comfortably, doing our best, if possible, to hold the body still, allowing the eyes to open if they've been closed. So there's the experience of seeing the soft gaze. We're not looking at any particular thing. In the same way, just listening without listening to any particular sound or receptive, feeling the whole body sitting, including the breath in the body, and learning to be present with the whole experience of embodiment, the five senses. And in this sense, making peace with whatever the mind is sensitive to now. Can this be okay? Seeing, hearing, feeling, sensations. Can this be okay? Is it safe to relax? To soften? 
Then noticing the mood or the qualities in the mind now. How's the mind? Is it tight or relaxed? Too much energy, restless? Too little? Sleepy? Agitated or tranquil? Just notice how it is. And finally, noticing how there isn't anybody who has to be aware. Awareness is here, knowing objects naturally. And take the time to adjust. And even as we're moving the body or taking a sip of water or whatever, the continuity of awareness doesn't need to change or cease. So we know when we're reaching that we're reaching. So I mentioned earlier that I'll take uh, at least the last 15 minutes before we end at nine to do the loving kindness practice together. But that gives us some time now. It's uh, really useful to hear people check in. What have you been learning? What's been challenging? For those who weren't here last week, we dug in a little bit about what gets in the way of the continuity of mindfulness. So it would be good to report in what gets in the way of the continuity of present moment awareness. And then how do you relate to whatever it is you're finding getting in the way? And does it help? Checking in about attitudes you're noticing and that capacity for an attitude to shift, that we're not stuck with these that show up sometimes. And then finally, hopefully some of you have experimented with walking meditation. It'd be good for a couple of you, one of you at least, to just share a little bit about what that experience was like, what you learned in the walking meditation, what maybe was challenging in that. And uh, again, with this size group, it's really okay for people just to unmute themselves. And then if you don't mind, you can introduce yourself just say your first name for example so we know who's speaking and yeah and then just share your reflection or ask a question so who'd like to begin what have you been learning hi i have a comment or kind of a question um tonight i was challenged um for the first time with really difficult emotions coming up Um, My chain of uh, thoughts that distracted me led me to um, a lot of sadness and despair. And that's really the first time um, since I've been taking this class with you that that's come up. And I'm wondering if you have any comments about that or if anyone does. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for your comment and question. Sadness and despair. And remember, and it's hard to believe, but it doesn't really matter what arises. 
pleasant experience, unpleasant experience, neutral experience. When I say it doesn't matter, it doesn't mean we don't, clearly we have preferences, right, for more pleasant and less of the unpleasant. But in terms of what the practice looks like, it doesn't really matter. So when strong emotions of sadness and despair arise, you know, usually there's some content, some thinking, and then the underlying feeling, the emotional feeling that's going along with the thoughts or the mental images. But in its essence, it's this experience being known, being felt. Oh, it's really unpleasant. Okay. This unpleasantness of sadness, unpleasantness of despair feels like this, looks like this. Is it safe to relax knowing that everything comes and goes? Is it okay to let this experience of despair show up now my body and my mind, my heart? Do its dance and then as everything does, pass away. I mean, think about it, all of us in our own way, you know, we've had really difficult in life, right? But then those moments arose, danced around, lasted for a while, and then they moved away. So this is the thing, when we're sitting and restlessness comes up, or in this person's case, sadness comes up, joy might come up. We want to see it as a visitor. And like in this sort of situation, these visitors have rights to show up when they show up. Oh, look who's here. Sadness is here. Okay. What's it feel like? Oh, it feels like this. This is the feeling in the body. This is the quality in the mind. It feels like this. It's unpleasant. Oh, I really don't like this. I really want to run. Okay, so that's also happening in the moment. The not liking is happening. The wanting to bolt or the wanting to control it. Okay, I see that too. That feels like this. So however it unfolds, it's just the next phenomena to be known with awareness. With that loving, compassionate, patient, generous presence. And if the mind starts to get tired because unpleasant experiences coming up over and over again, then ask yourself, what else in the present moment, what else is here in the field of awareness that I could pay attention to where the awareness could be intimate? So maybe I can't be with the strong emotion of sadness. So I'm going to be aware of hearing because the sounds that I'm hearing in the room are very neutral. Like here in my case, the blower is on in the building. That's kind of just like white noise, right? So that's pretty neutral. So I can use that as a kind of meditation object. Okay, hearing's like this. And because I'm really attentive to the hearing, I'm not paying attention to the sadness. So I'm getting a vacation from the heaviness, the unpleasantness of the sadness. And then maybe I'll do a touch and go. I'll turn my attention back to the sadness for a few breaths. Okay, breathing in. Oh yeah, sadness here, still here. It feels like this. Breathing out. Oh yeah, sadness, just sadness. And then maybe go back to hearing or feel the whole body. Right, so you don't always have to look at the most difficult, painful experience when the stability of awareness, when you have enough confidence, yeah, totally relax, allow it to be, even if it feels like it's going to kill you, okay? This restlessness feels like it's going to eat me up. It won't, so I'm just going to let it do what it does. But when we don't have the confidence or when the mind starts to get tired and we don't have that stability, that kind, balanced stability of awareness, then Ask yourself, what can I be present with now? And then bring the attention there. Yeah, thanks for the really good comment. Remember that technique. I briefly mentioned it last week. Even if it's just for a moment or two, name it. Oh, 
sadness. So it's like a little whisper in your mind. You're not saying it out loud. Sadness is being felt. Sadness is being known. This is the experience of sadness. And that, that can really stabilize for a few seconds at least the mindful awareness with the, with the strong emotion. And then you'll know when you lose that stability, okay, what else can I be aware of? And you might need or want to turn away from the sadness for a while. And then do that. Thank you. That was very helpful. Yeah, thanks for your comment. How about somebody else? What else have you been learning? Or what's been challenging? What's felt like? I think that's a beautiful testimonial, Kabir. I appreciate your comments. And, uh, and it's really true, you know, we, we basically used whatever thing we needed to survive, you know, and if we had a lot of pain as a younger person, sometimes we just buried it, sometimes we acted it out. But we just, just did the best we could. And some of those things we did were not that skillful. But that was, that was the <laughs> skill we had at the time. But now, you know, we have, like one of the things we do in the practice is we realize that when there's a strong emotion, there's often something quieter underneath it that's actually more important. Sometimes what seems really big is the anger, but under the anger is actually fear or a deep sense of woundedness, a real deep sadness, or not a feeling of not belonging. So one of the things that this powerful stability of present moment awareness does, it really helps us see what's behind stuff, what needs attention, a kind of healing of the ancient wounds. And it's not even just the wounds from our own life. Sometimes they're ancestral wounds that we picked up from our ancestors, literally passed down generation by generation, pain, unresolved pain. Sometimes it's just the kind of broader community pain that we're just sensitive to and feeling. But we're, we're doing our best to uh, be responsible for whatever it is we're in touch with and meeting it with love and meeting it with wisdom and meeting it with that stability of present moment awareness. Because that allows for the healing, it allows for the, the unwinding of what needs to be unwound. Yeah, I appreciate your comment, Kabir. Who'd like to go next? We have time for maybe two more folks to share about what you've been learning or just Questions that are emerging, comments you have? I can go. And you know, one thing I don't emphasize that much, but it's, it's really an essential meditation skill, is uh, using a meditation object more specifically and in a more exclusive manner. So, and it doesn't even need to be in a formal meditation, but like even something as simple as like when I'm doing the dishes, I'm not worried. Of, I'm not bringing to mind my relatives that are really struggling or my buddy who's really in a difficult place. I'm going to do these dishes and I'm just going to be 100% in the physical activity of touching and hearing and seeing. And in that way, for that 15 minutes of doing the dishes, I'm getting a vacation. Now, it, these responsibilities are real. You know, when we're friends, when we're relatives and they're struggling, we need to be connected. We need to know what's going on with them. If it's appropriate, we need to respond and help them. But we don't need to hold it all day long. And this is the thing about, um, it's kind of a misunderstanding about compassion, like that we have to, like that's uh, the confusion between compassion and empathy. Empathy is when, in a way, we're sympathetically vibrating with another person's suffering, right? I know that Frederick's hurting, and because I know Frederick, then I'm hurting. 
But compassion is really this enlivening wish. I see your suffering, I care about it, and I want your suffering to go away. And if there's something I can do, I'm going to do it. But it's really this empowering wish, may you be free from suffering. It isn't this empathetic um, co-suffering because you're suffering. And that's really important to, to experiment with, like with partners and even like a pet. Like if your dog is, you know, whatever, got a problem, digestive problem, and just uncomfortable, should you hurt? because your dog isn't feeling well? What would it be like to have a lot of compassion for the dog that's suffering really in pain and discomfort? A lot of, but to notice that that compassion you have actually feels good. It feels good to be compassionate. It's not a heavy state of mind to be compassionate. So the way to begin this is to remember that uh, with some humility that we may not completely understand what compassion is and that we tend to all drag each other down because we sympathetically uh, hurt when other people around us who we care about are hurting. And we really notice this with uh, partners. This has been such a powerful practice. My wife does a lot of this Buddhist meditation practice too. And we've learned over our 30 years of living together, you know, how to be very intimate when the other person is struggling and suffering without feeling like I also have to be suffering because my partner's suffering. And how I can actually show up better if I don't sympathetically suffer when she's suffering. So it takes some practice of, of really sensing. That's why we usually practice compassion where it's initially where it's really easy, where there is a little distance. So we can tune into how it's a beautiful emotion. Compassion is an enlivening emotion. We are aware of this person suffering or even our own suffering, but not presuming that we should get dragged down, that it should be a heavy state of mind because we care. Caring is a beautiful thing. Not wanting this, you know, this brings some injustice to mind that you're sensitive to for whatever reason. And, and that strong and clear sense, this is not okay. If there's anything I can do to alleviate this suffering, this oppression, I really want to do that. That's an uplifting quality in the heart. But it takes practice. Because we have that capacity for compassion, but we also have that capacity for empathy, where we're kind of tuning into where that person's at and feeling the same thing. And that doesn't help that person. You know, like if we're with a person who's in the hospital and really in a difficult place and, and freaking out because they're in a really difficult medical crisis, and then we start to freak out because we don't want them to be in a difficult medical crisis, how does our getting upset help them? What would be really good to do is model not freaking out. Right? Like how to be really there, really understand the enormity of the medical crisis, but, but really be established in this well wish. If there's any way you can handle this, I can help you, you can help yourself, may that happen. May wisdom and love protect us here. And this is what we'll do now for the last 10 minutes before we end at nine. Let's do a little compassion practice because Frederick brought, brought it up. Remember, you could do any of the four emotions that are related to love, basic friendliness, compassion, appreciative joy, and equanimity. But I'll just go through some of the formal instructions. We'll do more of it for week six. We'll do it for about 15 minutes at the beginning of the sit next week. But please practice it at home. Use week five handout 
the instructions are pretty straightforward. And you can go to dharmacy.org through the Calm Ground website, and you can get lots of guided loving kindness or compassion meditations to support you so you get some experience. Then in any case, just sit comfortably as best you can. You can close your eyes. And we're going to begin by just bringing some compassion to this body, which is often a relatively easy place to begin. Because it's not easy for a body to be a body. So many challenges, including the gene process itself. And so we just realize the simple truth. It's not easy being a body. And I care. I care about the vulnerability of this body and the wounds, the injuries, the weaknesses. And I care enough about this body to wish well. This beautiful, generous wish. May this body be at ease. May wisdom and love protect this body. May this body be healthy. And may it take care of itself as it navigates its life. So we're just opening to the body and we're bringing to mind, we're realizing the very natural fragility of this body, this aging body, this tender body. And we're letting the heart be moved. I do care about this body. May wisdom and love protect this body always. And may this body be healthy and at ease. And I care about my heart right here. This tender heart that feels things deeply. This heart that's felt pain, the pain of loss. Sometimes the pain of humiliation, the pain of insecurity. I deeply care about this tender and vulnerable heart and mind right here. And I care enough to wish well for myself. May the deepest wisdom and love protect this sensitive heart and mind. May I navigate my life with wisdom and with kindness, forgiveness. May I find my way with ease. And then bring to mind somebody you know reasonably well who's having a hard time right now. Maybe not the person who's having the most difficulty in your life, but just somebody, a dear friend, for example, who's got some struggles. And just realize that, yep, it's not easy, human being. And I, I hear you, I see you, and I know that it's not easy for you also being a human being. And that sometimes you really hurt or things are scary. And I care about that. And I'm not afraid of your suffering. I'm willing to be here right now with your suffering. And with this beautiful wish, may your deepest wisdom, your capacity for love, may protect you as you take care of your life as best you can. May the deepest wisdom and love protect you always. And may you find your way in your life, may you live your life with ease and skill. And all the beings on this planet, human beings and other creatures, there's so much suffering, so much loss, so much oppression, people and other 
creature is being taken advantage of. And just in our own ways, it may be a very particular image, more general image, but just acknowledging the enormity of suffering close to home, far away. I care about the great fragility of life, the great vulnerability. And I care enough to do my best to be right in the middle to have a very honest awareness of the truth of suffering and to let my heart break a little with love and compassion and the deep and beautiful wish. May love and wisdom protect us all. May love and wisdom guide us as we live our lives as best we can. May we all find our way toward the release of stress, the release of suffering. May we all be at ease in this changing, unpredictable world. May we all live with ease. And just for another minute or two, just feeling this tender heartedness like a beautiful warm light spreading, expanding. I care about suffering. I care enough to offer this simple wish. May all beings be free from suffering and free from the causes of suffering. May all beings be at ease. And when you practice the compassion or loving kindness, some people like to put their hand in their heart just to feel that emotional heart energy really accessing it. And remember, there's a lot of room for creativity in these four, they're called the divine abodes, these four emotions that the Buddha said is all we need as an emotional being. We just need kindness, compassion, the capacity to appreciate and equanimity. So see if that's true. We have this week to check it out. Please do your best to join again for week six. I know it's not always easy, but really commit to giving yourself these six weeks to deepen, check out the practice, and uh, hope to see you then. Take care, everybody. Thanks for coming tonight.